All right, I wanted to make a video just to kind of finish the Vietnam War that we've been studying. We have looked at a lengthy video on the beginning and causes of the Vietnam War, and then we've done so many things looking at music, um, looking at the Dear America letters, my my simulation that kind of walked you through 1968, study guides. We've done a lot, but now it's time to kind of bring it to a close because we truly could be on this topic for another month. So this is called Nixon and the End of the Vietnam War. All right, remember, this is Richard Nixon. He failed in 1960 to win the presidency. In 1968, he wins. He runs in 1968 as the law and order candidate who wanted to end the war. This is a time where many people left the Democratic Party for at least this one election because they wanted an end to the chaos they were seeing, the, the hippie movement, the, uh, the counterculture, the music that was coming out, the lawlessness, um, the protest. They kind of wanted to end to all of that chaos. They also wanted to end to war. So let's, it broke down political affiliation. Now, when he comes into office, 1969, 1970, Richard Nixon has a desire to gradually withdraw our troops. He is going to support the South Vietnamese in their fighting in what he would be labeling a Vietnamese civil war. North versus South, the South needs to be supported to win. He calls this gradual uh, giving of the war to the Vietnamese Vietnamization. And that's what's at the top of the screen. Vietnam Ization or Vietnamization. It's the gradual process of giving the war back to the people who are the largest stakeholders. You'll see that in 1969, in the spring, he starts to bring home troops with 25,000 troops being brought home in 1969 in June. However, notice that's 1969. In 1970, he does something that seems to be counterintuitive. He widens, he widens the war. So we have to understand that there's this Ho Chi Minh Trail that leaves North Vietnam, travels through both Laos and Cambodia, and then supplies the VC or Viet Cong of South Vietnam. The Ho Chi Minh Trail when it travels through Cambodia, was such a threat to South Vietnam and American goals that there was a plan in the spring of 1970 to bomb VC bases that were in Cambodia and destroy the actual Ho Chi Minh Trail. Now, before we get to the protest shown at the bottom corner, Let's defend what Richard Nixon was doing. Though he told everybody he wanted to leave the Vietnam War, he couldn't leave a war where South Vietnam would overnight lose. He needed to strengthen South Vietnam's odds by destroying the Ho Chi Minh Trail, by destroying bases that were in Cambodia. But, now to Kent State, to an outsider, it looks like the president who promised peace is actually escalating the war. And the Ked State protests leading some to die um, by the hands of um, National Guardsmen in Ohio will lead to a very popular song by Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young called Ohio. All right, so you guys can go listen to the song Ohio by Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young, um, mostly written by Neil Young himself. Uh, it, it was just ripping at the fact that people felt lied to, that there was this credibility gap between those in charge and those who were kind of being forced to follow. 
by 1971, um, out in the news through the print media, the Pentagon Papers are printed. Now, the Pentagon Papers are a name given to top-secret Department of Defense study of the U.S. and political involvement in Vietnam from 45 to 67. So the State Department, sorry, the Department of Defense was actually researching itself on what it was doing, its motivations, both good and bad. Well, when these were released by the media, if you will, leaked to the media, they were then printed in the press and nicknamed the Pentagon Papers. The Pentagon Papers truly made it sound like the United States was in the war in Vietnam to uh, have access to rubber, to open up markets, to access to China, um, not necessarily to stop the spread of communism as we were being told. In 1971, in the aftermath of um, the My Lai Massacre, Woodstock in 1969, Cambodia Extension in 1970, the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution that gave the president so much power in this conflict was repealed. In 1973, Congress, which at this time was mostly Democratic, passed the War Powers Act, which is largely still in play today. The War Powers Act makes the President of the United States, though Commander-in-Chief, more obligated to seek congressional support. So if Congress ever says you may go to war or conflict, just say conflict, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, or Vietnam, that every few months the President needs to come back and get a reauthorization for this use of force. Remember, Congress pays the military's wages. If the president cannot prove that military force still needs to be used, Congress can stop paying the soldiers' wages, can stop buying more bullets. Thus, the president of the United States, though commander-in-chief, would not have an army with material to fight. So you can see that in the early, early 1970s, Richard Nixon was having a hard time um, staying in Vietnam and staying the course. But however, in 1972, he runs for re-election. And to an outsider like me, I would think that he's going to lose in 1972. However, he faces a George McGovern who has a very liberal approach to politics, but not a liberal enough for everybody. So you kind of see a Democratic coalition splitting in 1972 with both uh, the civil rights movement and also the emerging women's movement. Um, what we start to see is people are just tired of protest tired of change, um, and Richard Nixon announces in October of 1972, a month before the election of 72, that peace is at hand, that he and people like Kissinger have been holding peace negotiations with North Vietnam, and if you please re-elect me, Richard Nixon, and stay the course, I will deliver you peace in Vietnam. We nicknamed this a October surprise because it was very convenient that Nixon releases this information right before the election. With very, very few details, he's asking everybody to trust him. In the end, I'm widening down. The United States by 1972 and 73 is changing its mind on the future of its relationship with Asia. In the cartoon I'm showing you, you see Richard Nixon dancing with Chinese dictator 
Mao Zedong. You'll learn a lot about him in 10th grade. Mao Zedong controls about 500 million Chinese people in the People's Republic of China. And Kissinger, shown down the bottom corner, National Security Advisor and uh, Department of State at one time as well, um, they're kind of saying, why don't we leave Vietnam but become allies or at least friendly with China? China will put a, a, a rift between the relationship between communist Russia and communist China. Plus, as many of you know, if we become friends with China in the early 70s, maybe they'll eventually make our clothes. And that relationship today, where China makes a lot of the stuff in the world, actually starts here with Nixon. The deal is very simple. We will leave Vietnam. We will open relations with China. And in 1973, there is a peace deal. The United States will take all of its troops out of Vietnam, though we all understand that process will take days, months, years to accomplish. Thus, by 1975, we have this long-lasting image seared in the American collective memory. Before I push any bullets, I want you to understand that these people are on top of the United States Embassy in Saigon. We are retreating onto helicopters out of the city of Saigon in South Vietnam because the North is invading. As the United States has pretty much taken most of its troops out of South Vietnam by 1975, the North decide to invade. No world will there be a North and South Vietnam any longer. The North Vietnamese invade. The South asks us to please stay longer. The president at this time was Gerald Ford because of the Watergate scandal. We will talk about that later. President Ford asks Congress for money to stay longer in Vietnam. Congress, at this time under Democratic control, says, heck no. You may substitute the word heck with stronger language. Congress is like, no way are we staying in Vietnam in this war any longer. Since 73, we promised to be leaving. We are leaving. And the picture you see up in, uh, on the screen is April 30th, 1975, as North Vietnam takes the city of Saigon in South Vietnam in American retreat on these helicopters, and of course, they rename it Ho Chi Minh City. As of 1975, there is only one Vietnam, meaning the Cold War saw a split in Korea, North and South, which because of containment still is North and South. But there was an unsuccessful attempt to contain communism in North Vietnam, and that is why today Vietnam is led by the Vietnamese Communist Party. Some of the legacies of this war is our soldiers. We had a million of them serve, but they did not come back at one time to ticker tape parades. At times, soldiers were coming home from this war and people weren't even going to the air bases to clap. Hundreds of thousands of Americans will be wounded. Over 60,000 will be killed uh, or missing in action. You could see in the visual up here the number of dead in the Vietnam War dramatically compared 
to the number of dead in the war in Iraq back in the early 2000s. This war was the last time the United States tolerated death tolls so high. Some of the teenagers, the hippies, the protesters, and the soldiers that came of age during this age will have psychological, alcohol, and drug issues and unemployment problems. There is a swath of people, the baby boomers, who go to college, and then there's a swath that don't. And some that come back are underappreciated, undersupported, not put into colleges with a GI Bill of Rights, and then will struggle in the 70s to get by. There will be a loss of faith in the government. The government says we're doing it for this reason, makes certain promises, and then we see images like My Lai Massacre and the Pentagon Papers. There's going to be an anti-U.S. feeling at home and abroad. The United States is looked to as the former policeman of the world, but yet is unable to solve a Cold War problem in what people would think of a third world developing nation. I guess the last bullet I put is the new American culture. From the Vietnam era, we start to see the absolutely the days of leave it to beaver. That, that certain innocence in America are over. And our music shows that. Our music shows anger, disillusionment, frustration, infuses uh, drug and alcohol without um, any problems with that. So we also see that there's a whole generation of baby boomers who come of age who feel they can openly disagree with their parents. And it's almost more popular to be a, uh, a, a child who speaks against their parents than there is to be a child that conforms to society's wishes. So everything we have studied in this class about conformity, um, they're out the door by 1970s. Now, don't think I'm criticizing this at all. But I'm at least acknowledging that this war, um, tied to the, the, the baby boom generation, the civil rights movement, the women's movement, and all the other movements going on in America at the same time, kind of means there's going to be a whole new America by the 1980s. All right. I'm feeling pretty good. You guys have a good day.